Sometimes history inspires us. I believe that this nation should commit itself to achieving the goal before this decade is out of landing a man on the moon and returning him safely to the earth. Sometimes we find ourselves in the middle of history being made. The next American man and the first woman ever will be Americans on the surface of the moon within five years. EGS program chief engineer, verify no constraints to launch. Three, two, one, and lift off. Welcome to space. Now we are in the middle of the most aggressive push for the moon since we landed there the first time 50 years ago. And leading the charge is the first female launch director, Charlie Blackwell Thompson. She and her right-hand woman, Jessica Parsons, took a few minutes out of their incredibly busy schedule to share some unique perspectives. All right, I'm here in the booth now with Charlie Blackwell Thompson and Jessica Parsons. Ladies, thanks for joining me today. Oh, we're happy to be here. Yeah, thanks for having us. Absolutely. So I want to let you all introduce yourselves. Um, so tell us a little bit about kind of what your role is for NASA and Exploration Ground Systems and kind of how you got where you are, just real briefly. Okay, well, Jess, you want me to go first or? Sure. Okay. Well, I'm Charlie Blackwell Thompson. I am the launch director. So I think I have a pretty... So, so, oh. so hold on, launch director. <laughs> That's pretty awesome title. Um, so I'm assuming that means really the buck stops with you when it comes for on comes to launch day. Um, that that's a pretty fair assessment, I would say. Um, it is a it, it's a fantastic job, and I think a lot of folks think about day of launch when you think about the launch director, right? The one that gives that final go to the team to proceed into terminal count. Um, but our days are really filled now with getting ready for that launch in planning the launch countdown, the procedures, and getting our team ready to go. So there's a tremendous amount of work that goes into or precedes that actual day of launch. So, But no doubt about it, um, I have an absolutely fantastic job, and I get to work with an incredible group of people. And I obviously cut you off, so I want to let you continue. Kind of tell us, how did you get to be the launch director? Well, let's see. I came to Kennedy Space Center um, 30 years ago, right out of school, um, right out of Clemson University, so go Tigers. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, and I had a tour of Firing Room 1. And as part of that, it was an interview for the over in the payload side of the house, and it was actually in their flight software area. And so I toured through Fire Room 1, and I heard um, the team that was actually getting Space Shuttle Discovery ready for return to flight. And they were in there working, and they were testing out the flight hardware, and I was really struck when I walked through the room with wanting to be a part of that team. And so I was lucky enough to get selected for that job, so I started my career in payloads. Uh, thought I had the most fantastic job in the entire world. I got to work on planetary spacecraft. I got to work on the International Space Station. I got to work on the Hubble Space Telescope. So here I am, a country girl from South Carolina. I get this <laughs> amazing opportunity. And then when the shuttle program ended, I had an opportunity to take some of that experience I had on the launch side of things and move over to um, Exploration Ground Systems and help them with their launch planning, which eventually led to the, the role of the launch director. Amazing. And so for those that don't know, the firing room that you toured uh, is now where you will be conducting a team to launch SLS here, hopefully next year. Yes. Um, it is not lost on me at all. When I walk in that room, um, and I'm, I'm in there, you know, multiple times a week, when I walk in the room, I have that same feeling I had 30 years ago, is that I want to be a part of this team. I want to be a part of this team that's getting our ground systems ready for the flight hardware uh, and a part of the team that is going to return, you know, to the moon in five years. I mean, how exciting is that? Yeah, it's pretty awesome. So we will talk more about that in a minute. Jessica, I want to make sure you get a chance to introduce yourself. So um, is it is it fair to say that you're kind of playing right hand to Charlie? Is that an accurate assessment? Yeah, I will say that. I am Charlie's uh, technical assistant. And... Um, this is a new role, I think, both for her and for me. Um, let's see. I'll give you a little bit of my background. Um, you know, I grew up since, you know, I can remember probably when I was five years old, I was like, I want to work for NASA. That was my dream. I had uh, my career set in mind since I was a little kid. So what I did uh, in high school, actually, was I talked to my uh, career counselor and I said, well, what career will get me to work for NASA? <laughs> and 
that were like, well, maybe an engineering field. So I started looking at different. There was like aerospace engineer. I'm like, well, that one has the space word on it. I'm going for it. <laughs> <laughs> I would tell you something a lot of people probably don't know, but I didn't speak English until I was 15. Hmm. So I found myself a different language, and I went to a college education just because I wanted to pursue my dream to work for NASA. That's awesome. And um, so that's the advice I would give, you know, not only the little girls or girls or anybody, just follow your dreams, you know. Uh, doing that is what has gotten me where I am today. Just never giving up, uh, following every obstacle, you know, following through, giving my best every time. And uh, I think, you know, whatever they want to achieve, they will get there. And I will say I ended up, you know, working for Charlie kind of by luck. Uh, <laughs> she was needed. <laughs> she was needed some help uh, doing some technical integrations for aspects that were related to launch. And I had work for her doing an assignment. And she said, oh, it's some help I kind of need uh, in this area. And then that ended up turning into a more full-time job. And I've been doing this probably for the last year now. And... Um, I will tell you, it's it's a job that I love. I never thought in my career that I was going to be, you know, supporting the fire room. And we had our first, like, cryo sim demo. When we had that, I was like, I sat in the fire room. I listened to the teams. I was just there kind of listening my first time going through, you know, the countdown of what it would be, a demo of our countdown. And I was like, wow, this is what I want to do. I want to be part of this team. And since then, I think I haven't looked back. Yeah. And she she doesn't give herself, I would say, full credit, right? Jess is responsible for many of the technical aspects and the technical integration of uh, our launch countdown. And so she leads a lot of different studies, a lot of different trades that we do. Um, she is um, the when we look at our requirements for launch, she she um, leads that effort uh, for me in terms of the evaluation of those requirements and kind of how they fit into our planning. And so um, she is very much key uh, to everything that we're doing on the launch planning side of things. So kind of a pair of questions. Number one, is it nerve wracking to try and design all this without having the actual hardware here? And number two, is it normal? Is that what happens for every space vehicle and, and rocket and mission? Well, I think it is normal. Um, I'm going to take the, I'll say the easier part of that <laughs> first, right? I think it is normal. Um, if you look across the suite of launch vehicles, both NASA and commercial, and I'll go back in my background to, to you know, early ISS when we were designing the ground systems to support the flight elements that would come. So I think that is normal. I mean, but the exciting part is when you get the flight hardware here and you begin to integrate the flight hardware with the ground systems, you begin to power up those those flight elements and they come to life and, and you see what sort of challenges they may throw at you, um, things that you got to go work to resolve. Um, to me, that that's the, I'll say, the fun part. And so we <laughs> definitely look forward to getting that flight hardware here at KSC. So once we get hardware here, once we check it out, we know we're, we're in good shape, it's time to get ready for a launch. And so launch countdown is where I, I believe your job's really kind of that's where it all culminates, isn't that countdown? So, um, and I've looked over some shoulders. I've seen some of these manuals. How big is the countdown script? Because there's actually a script that you guys use. How big is that? Well, that's a hard one to answer um, just yet because it's still being <laughs> developed, right? So we're still working on it. But what I can tell you is, and it won't be as big as what we had in Shuttle, but in Shuttle we had six volumes of launch countdown. And when I say a volume, you know, it occupied a multi-inch binder because uh, it was all paper. And so we had six volumes that defined launch countdown. Now, when I say that, it wasn't six volumes of, you know, every step we're going to go do. It was a couple of volumes of every step we're going to go do. It was a volume that said, this is what we do when we scrub, and this is how we turn the vehicle around. And here's what we, and we had another for any kind of issues that arose. So we had what we call pre-planned contingency procedures. Uh, 
where if you had an LCC exceedance, you could go run these and hopefully get to a, a point where you could go launch. We will have something similar. It won't be nearly as big. Um, but in terms of page count, it's hard to say right now because it's still <laughs> still in work. And it's also electronic. electronic yeah. So it, it's different um, than what we had. So it's not quite as visible in terms of, of the volumes. You know, it takes up a bookshelf. It, it's not quite like that. Uh, so, but it will be, it will be hundreds of, of equivalent pages when we're all done. Jess, do you think you'll ever get to a point where you feel like y- you know the countdown, like where, where you've <laughs> been through, the, you've been through the book, like you, you really like feel like I know this countdown. And obviously, like the book is there to make sure every step is right. But can you get there on like this massive process? I think so. I mean, I think I have to, or why she'll <laughs> fire me. <laughs> no, but I think, and it's partly linked to the process that, you know, we're reviewing the requirements, you know, a year, two years in advance prior to the launch. So I'll be able to become familiar with, okay, what is supposed to happen, what what is needed in order to support this requirement, what is the timing of it. And, you know, we also have the process where we do a lot of simulations to train our launch team. And I think being part of those really helps us, you know, walk through that launch countdown and make sure that every day we become a lot more familiar with it. And I would say from from my experience on shuttle, you know, I didn't know the entire book. Um, because you you really do depend on your team to know their particular steps. Yep. But what, what you do know is how all of that work fits together and kind of what you have to do, kind of what you have to do first, what you have to do second, what drives what, you know, the, the kind of the puts and takes of, of launch countdown. And, and those things that are critical, um, you absolutely know. And, you know, I can remember in shuttle – And we'll have similar steps uh, for this vehicle. But I can remember in shuttle, you know, we had, as you got down late into launch countdown, you had a series of steps that, you know, if in the event that you had an engine that got shut down or you ended up, um, you know, having a cutoff on the pad, you always had your fingers sleeved into those contingency steps because you knew <laughs> that you're going to run those steps and you're going to run them quickly. And and I can tell you, even now, it's been years um, since our last shuttle launch, and I can still run through those first few mm-hmm. steps um, from memory because, you know, you, you practiced them, like Jess said, you practiced them in a sim. It was something that was a part of every single sim. You knew that they were time-critical steps and they needed to be executed uh, as such. And so um, I would imagine that everybody on our team will have those areas that are most important and most critical for them, and they will absolutely know that countdown. There's no, not a doubt in my, in my mind. And so when you were asking Jess that question, I was shaking my head because I'm thinking, I know everybody's going to know that. And how much of that is because of the way that you operate? As far as, like, are you, like, are you drilling your team? Do you have, like, drills? Like, what are these sims like to, to get people ready to be prepared for that? Well, drill's kind of a tough word, so I wouldn't <laughs> hey, say drill. I, I don't know your style. I'm just asking the question. <laughs> um, I would say that what is the style? I mean, we certainly have an expectation of of excellence within our team. And, uh, and, I, and I would say that's for all of us, myself included. Um, we definitely practice. I mean, you know, we're at the beginning of our sim um, you know, our sim planning and at the beginning of our of our sim regime. And so my expectation is different today than it will be six months from now. Sure. But that's the reason we go through these is so that by the time we get to launch, those those challenges, those technical um, problems that can come up, those critical situations where you need to execute um, very quickly and very decisively, our team has had an opportunity to practice those and practice them and practice them again. And thinking about the fact that this is a team that make all this happen, we know that it takes an army from design through construction, through delivery, through preparation. How big of a team are we talking about on launch day? You know, we will have folks in uh, mission control as part of uh, the team there. In we Houston? Al- in Houston. Okay. We also will have folks that are in um, the Orion, their engineering team that sits in the Orion MER. We have a team of SLS, the SLS uh, engineering support team that sits in the SESC, which is a part of the HOSC in, at Marshall. 
And then we have our team here. Um, and so asking how big is our team, it's always a tough one for me because I know how many people sit in the firing room. We have uh, just under 100 folks that will sit in firing room one. And then we have a support launch team of folks that is, it's about 60. Uh, so really between the two rooms, we're about 150 folks. So that's an easy question to go answer. But for me, I believe that everyone that develops this hardware Everyone that tests this hardware, everyone that gets us to launch is part of our launch team. Whether they're sitting in a firing room or in an engineering support center on launch day, they are part of the effort that got us to that day. And it's and they're part of the launch team, regardless of where they are. But to answer your question, about 150 <laughs> folks in the far, between the two firing rooms. So, Jessica, I'll start with you. Um, not knowing the exact situation, how long is this countdown? How far out from zero do we really start kind of, do we really feel like, hey, it's launch day? Like, how far away are we? Well, I would say our launch countdown starts two days, uh, you know, prior to that T0 time frame. There's a lot of preparations that have to go down, like, you know, like Charlie said, we have to power out the vehicle. We have to do, like, multiple checks. And, again, they're all di driven by requirements. Um, and then we have to start the vehicle cryoloading. And, you know, that event happens, you know, we have to check whether the weather is going to support. There's a lot of a lot of different factors that have to be taken into account. But the decision to go ahead and do, uh, if we're going to go ahead and tank the vehicle, is done, you know, somewhere around like seven hours prior to the long, the T0 time frame. And, you know, that takes a while. You know, we have a large vehicle. So <laughs> <laughs> to put it in simple terms. Sure. So we have to, you know, balance the commodities that go between the core stage and the ICPS, the upper stage of the vehicle. And, um at that point, you know, that takes probably the majority of that last seven hours of it. And, you know, we have to monitor our ground systems, monitor the vehicle to make sure that everything's going as planned. So I would say, I mean, those last two days are definitely what we consider to be the launch countdown. I don't know, I put it in simplistic terms for something that is. <laughs> no, that is it, our countdown's it's just under two days, just covered it well. Um, I was sitting here thinking when you were asking the question about when does it feel like launch, right? Um, countdown two days prior, um, that's our call to stations. I think it will feel like launch when we roll to the pad because we know that when we roll out of the VAB that, you know, we are we have some work to do at the pad prior, but that is our commitment toward that launch date and that, that season yep. that we have where we have several days in which we can go launch. And so I think that final rollout is going to be an amazing event. And is this, thinking about the countdown again, is this two days around the clockwork or is this two days like on shift time? It is uh, two days around the clock. It'll be three shifts a day. Um, yep. Oh, it's going to be great. And so are you having 100 people like per shift in the firing room ready to go or is this just like Certain teams have to be there. Yes, yeah, just certain teams. Um, what happens is that it's really based on the work that has to get done. So we have something we call a bar chart, which lays out sequentially uh, the work that is accomplished in launch countdown. And so there isn't the the personnel in the room kind of come and go during, I'd say, that first day of launch countdown. But once we get ready for uh, cryo load, the room's, the room's pretty full, and, uh, and it'll remain that way through T0. But certainly that first day, it depends on the work that's, that we have. There, there are positions, like the test directors are always in the room, the integration console's always manned, uh, but the other consoles are staffed based on the work that they have to do. And as the launch director, I'm assuming that there's going to be part of you that will want to be present for 48 hours straight. That's probably an unwise decision, all things considered. So how will you, how, are you, have you thought through like how to break apart your time during those two days? Yes, I actually have started to think about that. I haven't gotten to the final answer yet, but luckily for me, um, I have great support. And, uh, and so I'll have to figure out those from tanking on, I'll definitely be there continuously. In that first day, you know, I'm really, 
really blessed because I have a really strong, um, our program has a really strong uh, test management group, the NASA test directors, as well as the TOS test conductors, and they execute that launch countdown on behalf of the launch director. And so they are staffed around the clock. They're there all the time. And, and they really serve during launch as, as the eyes and ears of the launch director. And so if there's something that they believe that I need to know, they certainly reach out. I check in with them regularly on that first day of launch countdown. Uh, and, uh, and then, you know, Jess will be involved as well. And, and she'll have some, some shifts where she'll be in the, in the, in the firing room kind of doing that same thing, you know, if there are issues and letting me know. But I have started to think about that. I haven't laid it out as to, you know, which shift or which time period, but definitely from tanking down continuous. And then prior to that, um, there'll, be, there'll be shifts that I'll be in the firing room and, and then some where I'll depend on the test directors or my sure. assistant launch director or Jess as a technical assistant to, to help with that. And I would be remiss if I didn't make a special point to say that you are NASA's first female launch director, which has got to feel like a huge honor. And I was actually talking with somebody. Has, are you the first female launch director, period? Because I don't think I did a little bit of homework and couldn't find anybody else. So first female launch director on Earth. Is that is that accurate? I, I don't know about on Earth. <laughs> um, I, I would say the first one for NASA. Um, okay. So, we know that's true. Yeah. No question about it. Yeah, I, I don't know about the. I, I don't know if it's bigger than that. But so when you when you got assigned, or I guess the, the question is first, like how does that happen? Is that like you get appointed to that? Did you apply for this job? Like how does this how does this transpire? Um, so there was an announcement, and uh, and I applied for it and interviewed for it and uh, and was selected. So it was um, that part of it is kind of the, I would say, the normal process that, like, many of us got, you know, our jobs. So it wasn't, a, like, an appointed thing. It was, a, you know, an announcement came out, and and I applied. Um, I'll never forget when I got the phone call, though. Um, that's when it really kind of became, I would say, real. Um, is, that, is that a holy smokes moment? You're like, wait a second, like, I got to go launch a rocket now. Well, I, I'll, I'll tell you, I, uh, I was actually walking across to a meeting. I was, in, I was um, at the time, my office was in the ONC, and I was actually walking um, to a meeting over in headquarters, and my phone rang, and I looked down, and it said Bob Cabana. And, uh, it was our center director. It, right. So. <laughs> and so I said, I wonder why Mr. Cabana's <laughs> calling me. <laughs> and, Either uh, a good thing or a bad thing, probably. <laughs> and so um, he, you know, um, offered me the job, and uh, it was post. You know, my interview had been several days before, and he offered me the job. And when he first said it, I I remember saying, "Bob, can you repeat that? I just want to make sure I heard you correctly." Uh, and he he repeated it, and uh, and and then it was the moment of, wow. Um, what a great opportunity and uh, what an honor. Awesome. Yeah, congrats again on that. I know that it's been a while since that happened, but I'm sure it's still kind of, and I'm sure it won't fully set in until you see a rocket leave the pad. And then it's like, man, that just happened. Yep, absolutely. Definitely looking forward. um, Definitely looking forward to that launch day. But I will say, you know, I... I am extremely blessed um, in this role, and I do feel honored. I am also very blessed to have the team that I that I have because I think as a launch director, you know, you're you're as you're as good or you're as effective as the as the folks on your team, and and I have an incredible, dedicated team um, that you know, is, is working toward launch and making sure that we're taking all the right steps and that we're working our products and that we're getting launch countdown ready and software's coming along and, and all of our progress and our sims and just all of that. It's a lot of work and, and I'm, really, I'm really blessed to have such a great team. And I know that you're probably so focused that this question might seem like a foreign concept, but is this the the final career stop is there somewhere to go past this like is there is there more career wise or is this like I'm good here I can just hang out until I retire uh, that that's a tough one um you know uh, let's see let me think about that for a second so I think about it like this um, 
a couple of summers ago, I went to um, like Zion National Park and Bryce Canyon. And every place we went, I thought, this is the most beautiful place in the world. And the next day, there was another most beautiful place in the world. And each of those, you, you stopped for a moment and kind of took that in. And so I think all of our careers, um, it's a path, right? It's a path and it's a, it's a journey. And every job that I've had, I've taken that moment, kind of like those different destinations within a national park where you say, this is an incredible opportunity. This is a wonderful place. Um, and I could stay here for a long time. And then something else came along. Uh, and, you know, when I was working in payloads, I felt that way. When I had an opportunity to go to the test director office, I felt like, oh, it's time to, you know, continue that journey. I absolutely right now cannot imagine a job um, that more appealing than the one that I have. Like, I love what I do. I love the people I work with. Um, I, I can't wait to see that vehicle out on the pad. And so for me, it's hard to think beyond that. But I never want to say, nope, this is it, because you never know what life has in store, you know. And if I had stopped at some of those other locations and decided not to take that path to the next one, I wouldn't be where I am today. I wouldn't get this opportunity. So I don't like to say, nope, there's nothing else after this. But I will tell you, it's hard to imagine <laughs> a job better than the one that I have, and there is sure. no other job right now that I would want. Cool. Jess, any interest in becoming a launch director someday? Oh, no. I, I've told her, I, don't, I mean, the amount of responsibility she has in that job, I don't know if I could uh, <laughs> deal with it. But uh, I am just glad to be part of her team and be supporting her. Uh, like I said, I don't know where my career would lead. Like Charlie, I've taken different roads. They'll uh, led me to a different place. I never really had a, you know, a plain career path that I said, yes, I'm going to be supporting the EM1 launch team. And yet here I am. So uh, I'm just honored to be, you know, working side by side with Charlie and, you know, being part of that EM1 launch team. So Fantastic. We're going to the moon. We need to not forget our destination here. We're not just launching a rocket. We're going somewhere. Right. We're going to the moon. The president has given us a charge to be boots on the moon 2024, five years from now. That road appears to run through the space launch system, which means that it runs through your firing room. Tell me about what that's like to hear that announcement come out about, hey, 2024, let's go. Exciting, right? I think about... Um, our first crewed flight. I mean, you're absolutely right, right? Boots on the moon in five years does run through our launch vehicle. It does, it does run through our explore, exploration missions. And it absolutely runs through firing room one and our launch team. And I think all of us on that launch team recognize that. Um, we recognize the cadence that is to come. And I know that there'll be challenges and things we'll have to go work through. But for me, it is absolutely exciting. So Jess, being a little bit kind of further down the line from that, mm -hmm. uh, as you guys are having meetings, you're, I'm sure this is coming up in conversation. Obviously, it puts a, an urgency to the 2020 launch of SLS. Is there a change in mood and atmosphere from the teams in the firing room or just in the, the, the planning and preparation portion? Yeah, I would say everybody in our program, it's, you know, really exciting. I think a lot of us have been working on this vehicle for a long time and knowing that, you know, we have this sense of urgency to get there, to, you know, have a distinct goal. Uh, it is very exciting. I mean, I can imagine, you know, some similarities back in the 60s when they said we're going to get to the moon by the end of this decade. And it's kind of that urgency, that dedication of people. Let's try to do you know, what we can to get there, um, pro, you know, drive, give the best of ourselves to make sure we accomplish this mission. So I think that is reflected on everybody that works for our program. Yeah. And I would, I would add to that. I'm, I'm glad you mm -hmm. said that, Jess, because it put a thought in my head is, um, you know, I think that when you think about that and you lay out the work, there will be an challenges, right? That, 
But one of the things that I think our team does, and I saw it so many times in the firing room and shuttle, is that when we have a challenge, when we have a technical problem that needs to be solved, our teams come together, they rally, they resolve it, and we move on. And so, you know, I look at this as a great opportunity um, for our teams to meet those challenges, and and I see the same thing. I think there's a, a sense of purpose and direction and urgency and um, and just a sense of excitement for what's to come. You know, we're a part of something incredibly special. So does it become some kind of like a, a war cry almost of like when there's long days, there's stressful days, there's challenges, it's like, hey, 2024, let's go. Well, I can only speak for myself, right? On my board, um, I have the words, what do I have to do today to get to EM1? And I really need to change that um, now that we have the Boots on the Moon 2024, and it really needs to say, what do I have to do today to get Boots on the Moon for 2024? Um, But for me, I I look at that every single day, uh, and I do think about that, and that is a guiding principle for me when I come in and figure out what am I going to spend my time on, um, it it really is through the lens of what do I have to do to get us to launch. And I know I'm not alone in that. I know that, that, you know, our program and our sister programs at SLS and Orion, um, while they may have something different written on their board, I know that that they're marching to that, that same cadence. Awesome. Thinking about your own paths to get to where you are and for those Charlie, kind of in your experience, that might walk into your firing room and just kind of marvel at the team. As you look and think about the next generation, what what would you say to them? If you could kind of have a, a few minutes with them, what would be the advice? What would be the words of encouragement or inspiration or challenge to them? Well, I love one of the one of my favorite parts of this job. Um, besides, obviously, planning launch countdown and 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 launch ops is the opportunity to speak to and work with young people. And uh, and I like to encourage uh, young folks to uh, to consider the STEM field. And because uh, I look at it, I had a high school teacher um, that actually when I was when I was in the eleventh grade, I didn't know what I wanted to do. And I was kind of thinking, you know, about different options. And my physics teacher actually said, Charlie, have you ever thought about being an engineer? And I was like, hmm, what would I do with that degree? Right? That was a question I asked him. And he said, what couldn't you do with that degree? Now, how right he has been, right? I mean, I look at all of the things that I have been able to be a part of. And it was all opened by that engineering degree. And so I would say uh, to young folks and, and to young girls, you know, to consider that STEM field because you never know, right, wh- where that path will lead you. Um, if you had told me in the 11th grade when that physics teacher encouraged me to consider engineering in college, that one day I would have an opportunity to work on flight hardware, that one day I would be a part of a shuttle launch team, that one day I would be the first woman launch director for NASA. That would have been hard to take in. But all of those things were possible because of the education and the background and the opportunity that that engineering degree brought to me. Now, it took a lot of hard work. It took a lot of other things as well. But, you know, absolutely, um, that was that first step. And so I would say um, engineering is, is, a, is a great career field, and it opens up a variety of doors. I feel like <laughs> we, we definitely face a lot of challenges on the day, you know, in our careers. Um, I'm trying to think, you know, of a specific example um, but I think just, you know, moving to me, I've done this a lot of my career where I move into an unknown field, something that I've never done before. Uh, and that's when I was kind of joking at the beginning. It's like, yeah, I've, I've gone through different places in my career here at the space center and not even with a direct path, but, you know, I took a chance and I would say maybe coming to this job was an example of that. I've, uh, I said, I don't have any experience on Launch Countdown, but I will learn to see what it takes to get there. And I mean, that's definitely a challenge. I cannot tell you there's not something every day that I don't 
learn about it for the first time. But, uh, you know, it's kind of like keep pushing your boundaries to get you there. Awesome. A great pleasure being with both of you. Charlie Blackwell Thompson, our launch director, Jessica Parsons, her right hand. I am so excited and so glad it's you and not me. Um, <laughs> good luck this coming year and obviously all the way through 2024. Thank you. Thank you. It's going to be great. We are excited to watch the triumph of the entire Space Launch System team in the coming years and wish them all speedy success. And special thanks to our guests, Charlie Blackwell Thompson and Jessica Parsons. To learn more about Exploration Ground Systems, visit nasa.gov EGS. And to learn more about everything going on at the Kennedy Space Center, go to nasa.gov Kennedy. Check out NASA's other podcasts to learn more about what's happening at all of our centers at nasa.gov slash podcasts. A special shout out to our producer, John Sackman, our soundman, Lauren Maythree, editor, Michelle Stone, and special thanks to Amanda Griffin. And remember, on the Rocket Ranch, even the sky isn't the limit.